Hello everyone, welcome and uh, thank you for attending the first session of the live webinar series sponsored by Neuroservices Alliance. My name is Diane Royer, I am the Marketing Manager at Neuroservices Alliance and I will be moderating today's webinar. This event is the first of a series that will feature our neuroscientist experts and showcase their work to show you how Neuroservices Alliance can be your efficient CNS drug discovery partner. We know that your time is valuable, which is why our online events will all follow today's format, which is 20 minute presentation and 10 minute questions and answers. If you have any question at any time, please don't hesitate to submit them in the question box that is located on the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. I would like to inform you that this session will be recorded and you will receive the recording after the session. However, I strongly encourage you to stay until the end as it is the occasion to have our panelists answer your questions live. Before starting, I would like to say a few words about Neuroservices Alliance. We are a consortium of CNS CROs specialized in in vitro and in vivo electrophysiological and behavioral studies. Our goal is to deliver endpoints facilitating decision making to our clients for their CNS drug discovery programs. We value direct and efficient interactions with our clients and we rely on a team of more than 50 PhD scientists. As a speaker, we have Bob Petrosky with us today. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm great, Diane. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So, Bob is a neuroscientist specializing in neurophysiology and neuropharmacology. He has more than 20 years experience in the biotech industry, leading several programs and has an insider's view on preclinical drug discovery. Bob is our USA scientific liaison here at Neuroservices Alliance. And we are now ready to begin. I let Bob take the lead. Thank you everybody for attending our inaugural webinar. I fell in love with patch clamp electrophysiology in 1985 when as a graduate student, I attended a Society for Neuroscience short course by David Corey, Richard Aldrich and Chuck Stevens. The patch clamp technique published in 1981 was revolutionary because it enabled scientists to record action potentials and ionic currents from small mammalian neurons. Sockman and Nair won the Nobel Prize of Physiology and Medicine in 1991, just 10 years after publishing this seminal paper. Patch clamp studies, widely used by academic researchers, have deepened our understanding of the molecular mechanisms of electrical communication by neurons and neural circuits. They also serve a pivotal role in the drug discovery process for CNS indications. In today's webinar, I will briefly review current opportunities for CNS drug discovery being actively pursued by biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies around the world. Next, I will briefly review the workflow of a typical drug discovery program. And finally, I will address how electrophysiological assays guide decision making at each step, and I will provide some specific examples. CNS disorders represent a tremendous health burden for society. A partial list of CNS indication is shown in this slide. These are largely chronic conditions that impact the quality of life for patients and their caregivers. Because most are inadequately treated by current therapies, there, is a, there are great opportunities to develop new and better medications. Most medications are small molecules synthesized by medicinal chemists. In vitro and in vivo electrophysiology assays can be used to assess the mechanism of action efficacy and potency, and target engagement by small molecule drug candidates. In 1982, human insulin was the first recombinant protein therapeutic to be marketed. Since then, many biologics have been approved. While this class of drugs represents only 2% of prescriptions, it represents 37% of net drug spending. Today, antisense oligonucleotide, Gene and stem cell therapies are exciting new strategies being explored with several recent FDA approvals. In vitro and in vivo electrophysiology assays can also drive decision making for these therapeutic classes. A typical drug discovery workflow is shown on this slide. Each transition point is a stage gate that requires a go, no go decision to progress through to the next stage. Since each progressive stage requires a significant increase in resources and costs, 
compelling and inclusive, conclusive data helps justify the GO decision to corporate decision makers. Highlighted in color are the stages where in vitro and in vivo electrophysiology data from Neuroservices Alliance adds value to your preclinical discovery programs. The first step in the workflow is target research. Drug discovery companies often select targets that have strong validation by the academic research community. However, many companies still want to replicate the academic literature before embarking on a new program. And some targets have only a limited literature, so further studies are needed to understand the target signaling pathways and mechanisms. At this stage of drug discovery, it is important to establish the assay endpoints or biomarkers that can be used for target engagement. Electrophysiological readouts in neuron cultures and brain slices can address these biological questions. This slide shows synaptic transmission data recorded from the CA1 region of the hippocampus using a microelectrode array. The MEA has the advantage of recording from several regions of the slice simultaneously. In this panel, you can see the trisynaptic circuit of a hippocampal slice. Axons from CA3 pyramidal neurons are stimulated by an electrode in green, and the field excitatory synaptic potentials, or field EPSPs, from CA1 dendrites are recorded from four to five electrodes in the stratum radiatum, shown in red. These signals are normalized and averaged to give a composite response from the slice, shown in this panel. This, this averaging results in less slice-to-slice -slice variability than experiments using single glass electrodes to measure field EPSPs. Long-term potentiation is a well-documented form of synaptic plasticity. It is triggered by high-frequency or theta burst stimulation of the Schaefer collaterals to produce a long-lasting enhancement of synaptic responses and is thought to reflect the cellular mechanism underlying learning and memory. You can see the enhanced synaptic response in blue in this figure. R62 transgenic mice contain 120 extra CAG repeats on the human Huntington gene and display a progressive neurological phenotype that mimics Huntington's disease. TG2756 transgenic mice overexpress mutant human amyloid precursor protein, resulting in elevated levels of amyloid beta and amyloid plaques. Both mice exhibit cog cognitive deficits as well as deficits in LTP. Thus, LTP can be used as a translational biomarker of therapeutic efficacy. Once the target is selected, chemical libraries are typically screened for biological activity at the cloned human target using high throughput or ultra high throughput methods. These assays are engineered for scale and are usually performed in artificial conditions with little resemblance to the native environment of living cells. Once viable hits are identified, chemists improve the efficacy and potency of chemical analogs through a series of iterative cycles of compound synthesis and biological activity testing to elucidate the structure activity relationship or SAR of the new chemical entities. This is the lead optimization phase. The biological assay used at this stage is usually the same binding or biochemical assay used in screening. The most promising compounds are then confirmed in an orthogonal assay. This is best done on the native target expressed in its native environment under physiological conditions. It adds great value to show compound efficacy and potency in neuronal cultures or brain slices. Importantly, these electrophysiology assays can help differentiate advanced lead compounds. There are many electrophysiological endpoints that can be measured at this stage. We work as your research partner to identify the most appropriate signal that best addresses your biological question. Patch clamp recording from neurons in culture is the best way to determine the efficacy and potency of compounds on neuronal targets. It provides the most direct measurement of electrophysiological endpoints, has the highest throughput, and is the most cost effective. For endpoints where intact neural circuits are required, brain slices must be used. Microelectrode arrays provide the advantage of recording multiple extracellular signals simultaneously. When the relevant endpoint can be measured extracellularly, the MEA recording technique is a cost-effective solution with good throughput. Extracellular signals include spontaneous action potentials, evoked field EPSPs, and evoked population spikes. When the physiological endpoint requires intracellular recording, patch clamp experiments can be done in brain slices. 
there is an immense range of signals and endpoints that can be recorded by patch clamp using current clamp or voltage clamp configurations. These include basal synaptic transmission, intrinsic excitability, synaptic plasticity, voltage gated channels, ligand gated channels. This slide shows a hippocampal pyramidal neuron growing on an astrocyte micro island in cell culture. The cartoons represent a recording pipette in tan and a puffer pipette in, containing GABA in blue. A solenoid valve controls the local delivery of GABA to the neuron, resulting in an inward current. When the neuron is superfused with endoplon, a positive allosteric modulator of GABA-A receptors, the GABA current response is much larger. Panel A shows a concatenated display of GABA currents elicited every 12 seconds. Only one in five responses are shown for clarity. When 10 nanomolar endoplon is applied to the bath, the GABA currents are potentiated. The responses reverse upon washout. When one micromolar endoplon is subsequently applied to the bath, the GABA currents are even larger. The superimposed risk current responses are shown in this panel. Baseline in figure one, in, in sweep one, 10 nanomolar in sweep two, and one micromolar endoplon in sweep three. The concentration responses for endoplon, zolpidem, and zopaclone, and zaloplon are shown on the right. This illustrates how the functional patch clamp assay was used to differentiate compounds. This slide shows action potentials recorded from hippocampal slices with the MEA technique. The upper panel shows that CA1 pyramidal neurons exhibit little spontaneous activity at rest, but bath application of one micromolar carbacol, the non-selective muscarinic acetylcholine receptor agonist, increases action potential firing. The effect of carbacol is concentration dependent. When the slices are pretreated with pirenzepine, the M1 selective antagonist, the carbacol concentration response is shifted to the right. This slide shows the interrogation of electrical excitability in cortical slices by patch clamp recording in the current clamp configuration. The upper right panel shows that depolarizing current injection to an excitatory pyramidal neuron in layer five elicits a train of action potentials that exhibit spike frequency accommodation. The lower panel shows data from a parvalbumin expressing inhibitory interneuron in layer two, three of the prefrontal cortex. PV positive neurons were identified by red fluorescence in slices prepared from TD tomato reporter mice. Depolarizing current injection elicits fast firing without frequency accommodation. This illustrates how we can interrogate specific neuronal subpopulations to address your specific questions. Several advanced lead compounds undergo more expensive pharmacokinetic profiling and preliminary safety testing. The top molecule or molecules are then selected as preclinical candidates. Most preclinical development stage studies evaluate safety and efficacy in vivo. In vivo electrophysiology is used to demonstrate target engagement by drug candidates. It adds particular value when it proves that orally administered drugs are absorbed by the gut and cross the blood-brain barrier to engage the CNS target. The highest fidelity data is recorded from surgically implanted depth electrodes. This figure illustrates how single electrodes or movable tetrodes can be implanted into any brain region. The cartoon on the right shows how the tetrode detects extracellular activity from a population of neurons proximal to the recording tip, shown in blue, yellow, and green. This slide shows the complex signal recorded from surgically implanted tetrodes in awake, freely moving mice. Single action potentials, commonly, commonly referred to as single units, are the fast spikes imposed on a slowly oscillating background or local field potential or LFP. LFPs can be recorded from both depth electrodes and surface electrodes. Recordings at the surface of the cortex are called electrocorticography or ECOG. This is a, a partially invasive technique requiring surgery, but does not penetrate the blood-brain barrier. It provides higher spatial, spatial resolution and signal to noise than EEG, which is non-invasive and is recorded outside the skull. 
LFPs are comprised of both phasic and oscillatory signals. Phasic signals include evoked potentials or ERPs, sharp waves or ictal spikes. Oscillatory signals include slow wave sleep or delta, hippocampal theta rhythm, and ripples. LFPs and rodents can be a preclinical biomarker for target for in vivo target engagement. LFPs and rodents are also a translational biomarker for clinical EEG. The right hand panel shows how the complex LFP can be deconstructed into overlapping delta, theta, and gamma rhythms. The proportion of activity at each uh, frequency can be quantified by power analysis. Ictal spikes are synchronous electrical hyperactivity that occur during seizures and reflect neuro network hypersynchrony seen in a disease phenotype such as epilepsy or also in drug-induced seizures. Pre-ictal spikes are the electrical hyperactivity that precede seizure, while inter-ictal spikes occur between seizures. <clears throat> TG2576 mice are reported to exhibit pre-ictal spiking. We confirmed the published reports by showing pre-ictal spikes in the CA1 region of the dorsal hippocampus in unanesthetized mice. Anesthetized mice. As reported, pre-ictal spikes occurred primarily during REM sleep. Furthermore, we demonstrated that the widely used anti-epileptic drug, levetiracetam, decreased the frequency of pre-ictal spiking in TG2576. This slide shows a hippocampal slice prepared from a human tissue resection. The close-up photomicrograph shows that a, a patch pipette approaching a pyramidal neuron. The upper right panel shows excitatory postsynaptic currents recorded in voltage clamp, and the lower right panel shows a current clamp recording of an action potential train elicited by depolarizing current injection. Biomedical research using human pluripotent stem cells has exploded in recent years. Human iPSC-derived neurons are increasingly employed for CNS drug discovery. At the target research stage, iPSCs generated from patient populations are being used to elucidate the genes and signaling pathways that contribute to human disease. Bioinformatics analysis of large transcriptomics and proteomics datasets are being used to identify the new drug targets. Because human iPSC-derived neurons can be studied at scale, it is possible to use them in functional electrophysiolog electrophysiology assays for lead optimization. Our newest lab in San Diego is dedicated to patch clamp recording of human iPSCs. Neuroservices Alliance has over 50 PhD scientists with extensive experience and expertise across multiple experimental techniques and platforms. We work as your drug discovery partner to design custom solutions for your research questions. We have a deep knowledge of CNS drug discovery and can, and can advise you on the most relevant studies that add the greatest value and make the greatest impact for your programs. Thank you for your attention. Diane, do you have any questions from the audience? Well, for now, we have a couple of questions. Uh, by the way, don't hesitate to uh, ask your questions now in the in the panel. First one is, how do I know what preparation and assay to use? So we design custom solutions. We look at, at the question you're asking, what stage in the drug discovery workflow are you working at? Are you asking a, a mechanism of action question or a target engagement question? Are you looking for a, a, a a, a signal in a mutant uh, mouse cell line? Are you looking for a, a pharmacological profiling of a compound? Does it matter whether it's in a neuron or do you need a network that's intact? What we do is we decide, we work with you as your scientific partner to come up with the best solution to answer your specific question. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, now, how much does it cost? So when we devise a, a, a study design to answer your specific biological question, 
what we then do is to s send you a proposal of the costs and timelines that it will take to complete your study. We do not have a, a diner menu of assays and, and, and fee-for-service prices off the shelf for this cost this much for a sodium current and this much for a, a field EPSP. What we do is we look at the big picture and the solution that we've uh, come up with an interaction with your scientists to propose a cost, but also the timeline that it will take for us to deliver your endpoints. Okay. Uh, electrophysiology is a low throughput assay. Will it take a long time to complete my study? Um, some of you might know that if you were graduate students or postdocs that, you know, when you're when you're one person working at a rig, it takes you a long time to collect the data you need to uh, address your particular question. At Neuroservices Alliance, we have multiple electrophysiology workstations. We have eight patch clamp workstations. We have nine microelectrode array workstations. So we work in parallel. We're conducting, doing experiments on many slices in parallel to collect the ends that you need for your study. So we have the throughput to answer your questions very rapidly. Okay, I have uh, two more questions. Uh, can you be more specific about your capabilities at San Diego? So the San Diego lab is, is dedicated recording from cells. So in San Diego, we can record from cloned receptors in cell lines. We can record from primary rat rodent neuronal cultures. That's either rats or mice. And more, what we're most excited about is the patch clamp recording from the human iPSC-derived neurons. Now, the human, we are not, I am not a, a stem cell person. So we are not, um, the, we are not generating human iPSC lines for your experiments. We, you, we source human iPSCs from the vendors, the same that you can source them from. In addition, we can also use the human iPSC derived neurons that your company is using for its research questions. So brain slices uh, experiments get done in France, Aix-en-Provence, and in San Diego, it's patch clamp recording from cells. Okay, thank you, Bob. One, oh, several more questions. Uh, what kind of APC platforms do you have? We do, unfortunately, we don't have any automated patch clamp platforms. So when I showed you that drug discovery workflow, I left the uh, screening portion in gray. Um, that's because we don't do any automatic patch clamp uh, services. Um, in your MEA devices, how many slices can you check at the same time? Nine. We have nine uh, workstations for MEA. And typically, an experiment, we, we, we run two experiments a day. So we prepare slices in the morning, can run all those slice experiments, and then prepare slices again for the a batch in the afternoon. And it really, it depends also on, on what kind of experiment. Some experiments are fast. You might be recording for only 30 minutes or 60 minutes, but some requirements, some experiments or some studies require a three or four hour recording. It really depends on, on the specific uh, study that we've designed for you. Okay. Um, do you also run electrophysiological recordings on other cell types like microglia, or do you just focus on neurons? That's a really good question. Um, I, I, I have personally recorded from, from a, a type 1 astrocytes and microglia. Um, nobody's asked us that yet, but there's no reason why we couldn't. Yes, yes, absolutely we can, although I haven't ever been asked to do that yet. And now, can you perform studies using those mice and rats? Absolutely. So a very important uh, factor for uh, drug discovery programs is seeing if your drug or your therapeutic, it could be an antisense oligonucleotide, it could be uh, other gene therapy. When you treated the animal in vivo with that therapeutic, can you then, we can use we can either do in vivo electrophysiology 
or we can prepare slices and do the ex vivo physiology from from animals either with treatment or without treatment. And in fact, that that's a that's a growing part of our business is testing uh, for activity of drugs um, ex vivo, drugs that were administered in vivo and then uh, endpoints measured ex vivo. Great question. Okay, I don't have any more questions to address for now. So do it depend. Do you want to add anything, uh, Bob? Or I think we are we are over for today. And you know we're here. We're here. We're ready to to help you uh, answer any questions that you might have about how we can help you. And we're always available for for web conferences during this time of COVID. And and per and and face to face visits once our the the COVID nineteen crisis is over. Well. Thank you, Bob, and thank you everyone for your attention. The webinars that come to an end. You will soon receive an email with the full recording of the session and, of course, a means to contact us. Please uh, do not hesitate to visit norservicesalliance.com to register for our next webinars. And after closing your GoToWebinar windows, there will be a very short survey that will open in your web browser. We appreciate your feedback. If you can take 30 seconds to fill it, it will be very nice. Thank you, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you at our next online events.